to the word. You know, um, last week I started a two-week series that I wanted to talk to you about called We Are the Church, right? And, and one of the things that I pointed out is one of the signs on our walls out there says that we don't just go to church, but that we are the church. And the church exists to make a difference in this world. So many times we think of church as a structure, as a building, and it's not. We are the church. The, the word for church is, is uh, uh, ecclesia, which is a collection of believers together. And we have to realize that uh, this building is a place we come to to celebrate, but it's also a place to get charged up and go out and be the church in the world. Last week, I shared with you a message entitled, Change Your Thinking, because so many times we have ingrained in us thinking from our past that dictates how we do things in our future. Our, our thinking determines many of our day-to-day -day actions. And I took Acts chapter 2, and I shared a few things that we found there that we actually have up on our walls today. And, and you've seen them, and maybe you've taken time to read them, but I would encourage you to stop in and read those. And one of the signs on the walls out there says that we desire to see everyone's life changed, finding hope through the transforming power of the Holy Spirit. And we are so thankful that God changes lives, doesn't he? We're so thankful that he, he allows the Holy Spirit and sends him to be with us and to reside in us. And we are the temple of the Holy Ghost, aren't we not? This, another one that we went over was that we want to lead the way as a church, as a group of believers in Christ. We want to lead the way with irrational generosity because we believe it's more blessed to give than it is to receive, isn't it? It's what the word says, isn't it? Oh, it's getting quiet. You're talking about money, preacher. Stop it, right? Another one that we talked about is how our faith journey includes others. We don't want to do this alone. Do you realize that God is on an all-out uh, uh, search to get more people to heaven? Did you know that? He doesn't want us to get saved and that's it. It's just me. He wants others. And we have to realize that we need to be inviting others into this with us, don't we? Don't we? Don't get quiet on me today, folks. Come on now. So when you, I got a question I want to start today with. When, when you see a person who's struggling, maybe they're struggling with alcohol, maybe they're struggling with drugs, or, or maybe it's a homeless situation or has mental illness. There's so many different struggles, and I'm not trying to label any one of them, but just anybody who's struggling, sin has beaten them down in their lives. What do you see? You think about that for a minute. What is your perspective of what you see. What is your view of the individual? And, and we so often have different perspectives of what we see when we see them. You know, for some, we become very critical of them, or we become very judgmental of them, or, or, or we become very harsh in our perspective of them. We don't see them through the eyes of Christ. We see them through the eyes of ourselves. Others, when they look at individuals who have been beat down by, by life and by sin, we, we see it a little differently. Some of us think, what's their story? Have you ever thought about that when you see an individual, that they didn't grow up one day to be homeless? That wasn't their goal. Someday I pray that I could just be a homeless person. That was never their dream. You know, and if you sit down and you go talk to some of these folks, you'll find out that they were college professors. You'll find out that they may have had very high-paying jobs or very uh, professional jobs. You'll find that some of them might have even been preachers. Uh, many of them were in the military fighting for our country. And, and you, you wonder, what's their story? I often think about that. What's the story that brought them to the place that they are today? You know, did he grow up in church? Were they a Christian at the time? Maybe, maybe they got in with some wrong friends and walked down some wrong paths. How many of you have known someone like that? made some bad choices, and it took them down a path they never planned on going, but there they went. Or maybe somebody else, they lost their job, or, or maybe they lost their, their girlfriend or boyfriend and uh, through a, a hard breakup, or maybe they're struggling with depression. Maybe they're struggling with anxiety. You know, there's many things that lead us down 
uh, those roads, and maybe, maybe those individuals are trying to find their way back to God. The question that I always ask is, have they ever been invited to come to church? Have they ever been invited to understand who God might be in their lives? And, and, and the reality is, and this question should be in our mind, is that individual the next miracle we're going to see happen? Because is it beyond God? No. Is it greater than God could ever do to, to bring somebody from that position to full restoration in life? It is so not beyond God, is it? All things are possible. Somebody say all things. All things are possible. So some of us are critical of them. Others see God working in their lives. Uh, can I just say that 90 years ago when Leaven First Assembly started, it was started for the broken. It was began for the hurting. It was began for the lost. Just like the ones we see around us every single day in our lives. And if we can't see this, if we can't grasp what we were created, what we were started, how come this church was planted to be, then let me just say to you today that you need to change your perspective. And that's what we're calling this message today, is we need to change our perspective. So you've got your Bibles, right? Go to Mark chapter 2 today. In Mark chapter 2 and verse 17, we're going to just read a verse and then go back. But I want to start with that because changing your perspective is so important. Mark 17, 2, 17 says this, It is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. Somebody say sick, the sick. The sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. See, Jesus is saying right here and right now, I came for those who are lost, who are hurting, who are broken, who, who need me. I didn't come for those who are already righteous. I came for those who need me, the sick and the sinners. See, I want to remind ourselves that this is not a country club for the saints. It's a hospital for the hurting. It's a hospital for the broken. It should be a safe place for the defeated to come and find hope. Right? Who are we? Last week I asked that question, you learned. Who are we? We are the church. Somebody say, we are the church today. You know what? We are here. We are here for the hurting. We are here. We don't just go to church. We are the church, and we exist for a, making a difference in this broken world. That's who we are. Mark 2, Jesus returned after one of his journeys. He returned to what might be considered the headquarters or the uh, the location where they kind of began their ministries and kind of landed, a, if you will, kind of home base uh, in Capernaum. And he was at that time teaching uh, in a home, in a small group uh, at a home in someone's house. And we're going to read that text in, in Mark chapter 2 of him in the home base at a home group teaching and talking and meeting and see the story around this. So in Mark chapter 2, verse 2, here's what it says. Follow along with me if you have your Bibles. If not, It'll be right up here. It says, They gathered in such large numbers that there was no room left, not even outside the door. And he preached the word to them. Some men came bringing to Jesus a paralyzed man carried by four of them. And since they could not get him to Jesus because of the crowd, they made an opening in the roof above Jesus by digging through it and then lowered the mat that the man was living on. Are lying on. And when Jesus saw their faith, whose faith? The four guys, right? When he saw their faith, he said to the paralyzed man, You just son, your sins are forgiven. <laughs> Is that why they brought him? They didn't bring him for sins forgiven. They brought him because he was paralyzed. I want to show you in this story. You know, so many times when we, when we look through this story, we all look at the miracle and we look at the faith. But I want to show you that there are, are some different types of people that are represented in this story. Oddly enough, you're going to see the very same types of people in almost any church you step into today. And I want to help you to see and maybe figure out where you are, which person type you might be in your walk with God right now. I'm going to show you five types of people today. 
five types. And, and I'd recommend that when we're going through this, I would like for you to try to identify which type of person you may see yourself as in this story. Can you do that for me today? In every church, the first type of person you're going to see, in every church, you're going to see somebody in need. You'll find somebody in need. In, in almost any church you step into, there will be somebody in need. There's always someone there who's hurting in some way or another. Can we all agree on that one? In this story, it's a paralyzed man. He couldn't walk. He's paralyzed, right? And most likely because of his paralysis, to make a living, he had to be a beggar. That's what he did. He sat on the mat out at the, at the courtyard or at a, a certain place, at a gate, anywhere to be able to earn some money to live. And for him to get around, he had to expect and look to people to take care of him and to pick him up. And so he had four strong people who he could rely on to carry him anywhere. Now, this guy's not given a name. And so for the sake of being able to refer to him, I'm going to give him a name today. And, and as I think about what I might want to call him, I guess the most obvious thing would be to call him Matt. What do you think? Does that work? It's kind of descriptive in names and good for the day. I think that might work, right? So in every church, there's always someone in need. I wonder which one maybe is in need here today. It could be you, right? It could be you, possibly battling some depression. Maybe you're going through a trial in your life that is just beating you down. Maybe you've had a recent loss or you're feeling a little bit hopeless in your, in your heart. Maybe even worse, maybe you're struggling with an addiction somewhere and it's, it's just getting to you, it's hurting you. Or maybe you're, you're a single parent and you're feeling all alone and overwhelmed by the, the weight of being a single parent. Or maybe you're struggling financially in your life or you're dealing with some anxiety or something. Are you, maybe you're the one, are you here today and you see yourself as someone in need? Because in every church there is, and it's not that it's good or bad, it just is. So the first thing we see in every church is that there's always someone in need. The second person that we can see in church, in any church, in every church, is that you'll see someone who cares. And aren't we thankful for that? You may very well see lots of people who care. You may be sitting near someone today who you don't even know who cares. You know, and as we get to know people, we begin to understand their hearts. And, and, and there are lots of people who are so loving and so caring and who are so willing to share of what God has for them with others and what he's doing in their lives and giving hope and sharing hope and praying with us. There's people who care in every church. In this story, we find four guys, four friends of Matt's who, uh, who care, don't we? Now, in my mind, I, I like to take a story and kind of fill in the blanks because there's some blanks in most every story. So you're going to have to roll with me a little bit as I give a little creative license to the story today. Are we okay with that? Okay, good, good, good. Uh, I'm thinking of these guys as maybe some guys from a men's breakfast. All right? We have men's breakfast here. I tell you what, since I moved here and we've been having men's breakfast, we, we do by men, just by the way, third Saturday of every month, we have a men's breakfast at Apple Tree. But in these breakfasts here, I have probably seen more uh, country gravy than I've seen in a long time at these breakfasts. It's just amazing what people put country gravy on. I've seen country gravy on eggs. I've seen country gravy on biscuits. I've seen it on, I'm talking here, I've seen country gravy on hash browns. Uh, they, they, these guys will slap gravy on just about anything. In fact, I saw someone order a side of gravy for their gravy. So, yeah, I mean, men's breakfast, you've got to have some gravy, right? In Vallejo, I met with, uh, um, at different times, I had, we had men breakfast as well, but at different times, I met with a group of about four guys. And uh, they're a little bit rough around the edges. Um, they, they were, uh, the best term I could put them at that point would be maybe they're sort of saved. You ever, you ever known somebody who's sort of saved? Right, right. Uh, I, I kind of like guys like that because it, it's, it's like something I can get in and talk with them about. But uh, these guys were sort of saved and they had huge hearts and, and they would have given you the shirt off their back and sometimes a little short on the common sense. True, right? You know the type. 
right? So we'd meet up and we would pray together and we'd talk a little bit about the Word and their faith journey and what it looks like to walk with Jesus. And, and I can imagine these guys being the four guys in this story, right? I can just picture this because we don't know that these four guys bringing Matt to Jesus on a mat were believers. So I'm going to roll with this one, okay? And so in my mind, these four guys in the story, a lot like my breakfast buddies, um, to conceal their identities, I'm going to give them other names, all right? So we're going to name these four guys who don't have a name in the Bible, who carried Matt on a mat. I'll call them Billy, Bobby, Benny, and Bo, okay? Can we do that today? Is that all right? And then we have Matt. So Billy says, hey, did you hear Jesus healed a blind guy? And Bobby says, he raised him from the dead. And Benny says, if Jesus can do that for them, he could do it for Matt. And Bo says, darn straight. Although I just got to tell you, Bo didn't use the word darn. He's sort of saved, okay? All four looked at each other, and then they shouted at the same time, road trip, all right? So they're going to go find Matt, get Matt together, and they picked him up, literally, on a mat, and they carried him to Jesus. Now, no one knows how far they went. Did they go across town? I don't know. Did they go down the street? I don't know. Did they go to another town? Nobody really knows because it never says how far they went. We just know that they were willing to do what it took to get Matt to Jesus. So when they get to the house where this small group is happening, and how many of you like small groups? How many of you like home groups, right? Those are fantastic moments of, of just being able to get together and really do life together. They get to this home where the small group is happening, where Jesus is teaching. And when they get to there, they realize and see that there's another type of person because every church has one of these or more of these in their service. Every church has, as you know, someone in need. Every church has someone who cares. But when these four guys carry Matt to the house where the small group is happening and Jesus is, they find and see someone who's preoccupied. And we find people in church all the time who are preoccupied. See, there was a, a house full of good people they were there to hear Jesus. That's a good thing, right? That's a fantastic thing. They were preoccupied and focused on Jesus. Wall-to-wall -wall people. Biggest small group ever at that time. So full. The four, buddies, the four buddies couldn't even get Matt to the door, much less through the door, into the house to where Jesus was at. Couldn't do it. So we, we have a problem here. Now, I want to take a moment and show you. This is a typical Jewish house right here. Pop that up. Thank you. And so you had a courtyard, and you see the front door. They couldn't get to the front door because people were out in the courtyard hanging out. And, uh, and what we typically are going to find is the walls were typically built of basalt rock, you know, kind of a volcanic-type rock. Uh, the roofs, you can see the, the kind of the columns, the beams sticking out, were typically of wood covered with like this mixture of straw and mud and manure and clay to try and make this uh, barrier there for them. And if it rained, then, then the, the clay absorbed the water, it sealed the roof, and sometimes stuff would grow on it and, and help make it look nice, and, and they could work on it. And the house was built for socializing. That's what it was in those days. It was built for everybody to socialize together. And if the door was open, the house was open, you're welcome. Culture was that way. If the door's open, come on in. And everybody had came on into a house very similar to this one. So when these four buddies walked up and the door was open, but it was too full to go in and people were spilled out into the courtyard area trying to hear Jesus, all the people inside, good, well-meaning people, but they were simply preoccupied because they were facing Jesus. They could not see Matt and his buddies behind him trying to get near Jesus. So they were focused in it, and good intentions, they were hearing Jesus speak of something that was just revolutionary for them. They were hearing him talk, and, and they were so focused in, they were so intent on what was happening that they couldn't see behind them that something was going on that needed their help and their attention. They were listening they were amening or whatever they would have done in that day, 
but their backs were facing Matt and his friends. They were preoccupied with Jesus. Hard to imagine that, isn't it? Folks that were so totally into what Jesus was saying, they had, they had, their, they had their K-love maybe going, or all their donkeys were parked out on the street with their, G, uh, their Jesus bumper stickers on their butt stickers on the backside of them, right? Maybe on the way they would listen to their favorite podcasts or CDs or cassette tapes, depending on your era of listening pleasures. And without knowing it, without meaning it, their posture and their position said to the person who was in need trying to come to Jesus, I don't even recognize you. I don't see you. For all I think right now, you know what? You you don't even exist in my world because they're so focused in on what Jesus is. As far as we're concerned, Because we're doing our little small group with Jesus, we're preoccupied. We're focused so much in on that that we're preoccupied. We can't see the need behind us. Do you think they meant to do that? No, of course not. But they were preoccupied with their little Christian thing that was going on and didn't realize they had their backs turned to someone in need. You know, last week, some of us, went uh, after service last week up to Sweet Home and watched the movie uh, Jesus Revolution. Fantastic movie. If you get to see it, I would encourage you to go see it. Fantastic movie. But in the beginning scenes of that, we found a church, that Calvary Chapel, that at that time was filled with people who couldn't see others needed Jesus. It was such a vivid reminder for those of us watching that these hippies who were trying to, they weren't welcome in the church. These folks were so preoccupied with their, their, their religious ways that they couldn't see the need around them of a generation crying out for Jesus, could they? And in that moment, it was like this thing that just came over me. And I, I just don't ever want to be that. I want to make sure that we see the people who come that have needs. I want us to be sure that we're not so focused in that we cannot see what's going on around us. See, the people of Jesus' time didn't mean to, but they were preoccupied. So in that moment, what's going to happen? So Billy and Bobby and Benny and Bo, they're about to give up on getting Matt to Jesus because the place is just packed. So Bobby says, don't forget, with God, there's always a way. And I don't know who needs to hear that today, but I want you to know, with God, there's always a way. There's always a way. I want you to be encouraged. Somebody needs to know that today. You may be in a situation, I'm just going to pause right there. You may be in a situation in a moment that you think is impossible. But I want you to know that with God, all things are possible. God knows where you're at. He knows what you're going through. And He is there with you in the middle of that. And that's why I'm willing to say things like, You know what? We're willing to do anything short of sin to reach people who don't know Christ. Do you realize that? I I am willing to do anything. I'm not willing to sin, but I'm willing to do just about anything short of sin to reach people who don't know Christ. And to realize that to reach people nobody else is reaching, sometimes we're going to have to do some things that nobody else is doing. You realize that? If we want to reach people nobody else is reaching, sometimes it's going to require us to step out of our comfort zones and do something that nobody else is willing to do. Ooh, it's getting quiet in here. With God, there's always a way, isn't there? What are we willing to do to get people to Jesus? So these boys, we got Billy and Bobby and Benny and Bo. So these guys are kind of brainstorming. It's a scary place for most people to be like that, but they're brainstorming. And maybe one thinks something like, well, let's pull the fire alarm, they'll all leave, and then we can get to Jesus. And another one says, well, that's a really stupid idea. We better not do that. And and then Billy says, he says, hey, let's go up on the roof and dig a hole, open it up, and we'll let him down in. And, 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 And Bobby says to Billy, well, that's a darn good idea, except he didn't use the word darn, did he? Most likely not. 
So these four guys get up on the roof with Matt on his mat, and they start digging a hole, and, and they're doing this in somebody else's roof. It's nobody they know, but they're ripping through this thing, and they dig through the manure, and they pull out clay and straw because they were determined to get Matt to Jesus, weren't they? We don't quite know what happened, you know, but they're, they're digging through this thing, and I can imagine this roof stuff, whatever it might be, starts falling down into the, the small group, into the home where they're meeting with Jesus. And, and, and so we don't know how big of a hole they dug, but we know they dug a hole. And, of course, for those of you who grew up in church, you remember the flannel graph, and they lowered Matt down on this wonderful, beautiful stretcher that was rigid with four ropes that they happened to have with them at the time. I don't picture that one, all right? So this is my story. Here's, here's my picture of it, okay? So uh, in my imagination, I can see them saying, here, uh, you grab an arm, you grab a leg, and I'll grab the other arm, and you grab the other leg, and we're going to let him down, all right? So they each grab Matt by his arms and legs, and I can just see them poking him down through the hole, right? And they're, they're trying to get him down in there, and they're holding him, and, and they're going down, and they're like, they're like, okay, and they're trying to, and, and it's like, well, they're still eight feet off the ground. We got a problem here. And then Bubba, or Billy says, hey, he's already paralyzed. On three. One, two, three. Woo. Boom. Right? Okay. Now that gives you a little insight into my brain, right? Scary place. Okay. So they get Matt down to Jesus. That's the story. There we go, right? And Jesus looks on. Now, he can't look on. He has to look up. So Jesus, I see him looking up at these four dudes who just dropped Matt through the roof. And he's looking up at them. <laughs> and, of course, they're probably country boys. And they're like, hey, G, <laughs> you know, talking to Jesus there. And he looks up. And when Jesus... And, and this is just amazing to me. When Jesus, it says in verse 25, when he saw their faith. Somebody say, saw their faith. Saw their faith. Have you ever seen faith before? You know, we say faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen, right? Jesus saw their faith, not Matt's faith. He saw the faith of these four dudes who just dropped their buddy through a hole in the roof. When he saw their faith, he said to the paralyzed man, and, and this is where we all get excited, he said, you're healed, right? No, he did not. He looked at the man on the ground, and he saw the men up in the ceiling, and he saw the faith of these men, and he said, son, your sins are forgiven. And I can just imagine the four guys upstairs going, wait, didn't we just bring him for healing? What is this about sin? We didn't bring him for sins forgiven. We brought him to get healed. And I can just see the confusion rolling in their brains at that time. See, Jesus saw the faith of these men for healing. And faith wasn't just an internal belief. Jesus saw the actions of their faith. How many of you know faith carries actions? It can carry a lot of actions. It was, it was an internal belief that was so strong, and it showed up in what these guys were willing to do for this man. You know what? Sometimes I see faith in action. I see faith in action when, when I see how you serve around here or, or at the storehouse or in, a, in an outreach we do. I see faith in you guys in the way you show up and the way that you come in and the way that you are designing and doing what you're doing for God. I see your faith in the way you give, and that is an amazing thing. I see your faith when your hands are raised and you're worshiping the Father and the Son and just giving Him glory and honor. I see your faith when you invite someone to come with you. I see your faith when, when you welcome someone who actually came through the doors. I see your faith when you love on someone who's really, really, really hard to love. Anybody know anybody that's really, really hard to love? That's faith in action. And that's what Jesus saw in these men, was he saw faith in their actions. And if you're paying attention, what did Jesus do for Matt? He forgave his sins, right? Back to the question, these four guys didn't bring Matt for forgiveness. They brought him so that he could get healed. 
They brought him because Matt was stuck on a mat. They brought Matt for healing and Jesus forgave him of his sin. And this shows us something really important. And, and it's a principle that I would, would love for you to be able to hang on to and get a hold of because I think we sometimes forget about this. We forget about what God actually has for us. We have to understand that sometimes God gives us what we need before he gives us what we want. Ooh, boy, I'm going to say that one again because that was way too quiet. I, I think maybe I need to change my delivery, preach a little differently. Sometimes God gives us what we need before he gives us what we want. Because we want things now, don't we? We want it now. We want it our way. That's the other thing we want is we want it our way. You know, and when we ask God to do something and we pray and he does it, but it wasn't in the way we wanted, most of the time we get a little critical of God, don't we? But God, that's not what I was asking for. And, and it was, but he sees what you need before, and he gives you what you need before and he gives you what you want. And most of us fall into that category. And we find that is very unsettling in our lives. And that may be where some of you are right now in your life. You might be asking God for this, and God is giving you that. You may want this, but you may need that first, because you can't handle this till you get that. See, God may give you what you need before he gives you what you want, because you're not ready for what you want. Ooh, that'd be a great place for an amen. You know what? We have to realize that we, what we want, isn't what we're always ready for. Write that principle down. Get it in your head. So let it sink in because it is a principle we understand and need to live out in our lives. So what do you see at every church? We see someone who is in need. We see someone who cares. We see someone who's preoccupied, right? And unfortunately, we'll end up seeing someone who's critical. Don't point them out right now. That's not real nice. Keep your, keep your hands, sit on your hands. If you see your husband starting to do this, then just go ahead and grab his hand and put it back down. Okay? We don't want to do that, right? But they're here. They're in every church, aren't they? They're every church. Matthew 2, 6 says, so continuing back to the story here, now, some teachers of the law, and we know that teachers of the law typically were Pharisees, educators, highly educated people who knew a lot about relationship with God. They knew the rules. They were sitting there, it says, thinking to themselves, well, who does this fellow, and why does he talk like that? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sin but God himself? The critical ones say, Jesus, you can't forgive. You can't. Religious folks say, hey, you, funny jeans with tattoos and earrings and the nose rings and the other rings. You can't do that. That's not how the church operates. You can't. You don't, no, no. We don't do church that way. That's how we do it today, don't we? We look at people who don't think, do things the way we think we should do it, and we get a little critical, don't we? But see, Jesus doesn't even stop for the critics, does he? He doesn't. He just continues on. Watch this. If we're reading on, it says, So Jesus said to the man, Matt, as we know him, after forgiving him of his sin, he said, I tell you, get up. Somebody say, get up today. He said, get up and take up your mat. Somebody say, take up your mat and go home. He got up, he took his mat, and he walked out in full view of everybody. And this amazed everyone, and they praised God, saying, we have never seen anything like this. Jesus gave Matt what he needed, which was forgiveness of his sin, before he gave him what he wanted, which was a healing, so he could get up off of that mat and take on a walk. And I believe God's saying to us today, take up your mat. You don't need it anymore. You don't need your mat anymore. God may be speaking to someone today. Take up your mat. Pick it up. And you're like, what does that mean? I'm not on a mat. Nobody carried me in here. It means that maybe it's what you don't need anymore. Whatever it is, lay it down. 
Maybe it's laying down your drugs. Maybe it's laying down a grudge you've held on to for generations or for decades. Maybe it's laying down your shame and leaving it behind. Or anger, leaving your anger behind, laying it down. See, picking up your mat means putting away anything that affects your relationship to God. Leave it behind. You're forgiven. You're free. You're healed. Pick up your mat. Get up. Move. Go. Move on with God. Go share my love with others. So you'll see every one of these. You'll see every one of these people in every church. And which one are you? Which person fits you? You might see yourself maybe even in more than one of them. You might find yourself in two of those descriptors. It's very possible. Which one are you? So if we look at them again, we see someone who's in need, right? And and this is a great place to come, isn't it? If you're in need, it better be. better be a safe place for people to come when they're in need. The next one is someone who cares. And I know this place is filled with people who care. I know this place is filled with people who have so much love and so much concern and care for people. It's true. What better place to come? If you're in need. Then we see someone who's preoccupied. And and this is some of us today. And if it's you, I just got to say, it's been me before. It could be you as well. But let's call it for what it is. If Here's a great descriptor of being preoccupied. Okay, and this is going to hurt. This is going to be a little tough. I'm just going to say it. And you're going to let the sting hit you just a little bit, Okay. If you've ever come to, if you've come to church every week, for the most part by yourself or with your family, without bringing anyone for a year, you're probably preoccupied. If you've been coming to church by yourself or with your family, but you've not brought anyone to church with you for a year, I dare say you're probably preoccupied. I hope I'm stepping on some toes today because sometimes those toes need to be stomped on, don't they? I know mine gets stomped on at times as well. And I'm just being honest. And right now, a few of you are probably sliding into that fourth uh, type of person that I mentioned that we find in every church. And that's someone who's critical. Because <laughs> right now you're criticizing Right now in your brain, you're running through all the scenarios why you don't bring anybody to church and why it never happens for you and how come I get I shouldn't have to do that. And you're just throwing out all the stuff, aren't you? Some of you are sliding right in. Boy, that was easy to slide into that critical mass point right there. That just that moment of, wow, I can't believe he just went there. Pastor, you're meddling. You're meddling now. You don't know my life. You don't understand what I go through. You don't understand. You don't get it. You just you just don't know. I gotta ask you, which one are you? Which person are you? There's one more left. And I know you'll find this person in every single church you step through the doors of, just like you will any of those other ones I just mentioned to you. All right? And here it is. Here's the fifth person. It's all of us. Because we're all someone who can be changed. Aren't we? Aren't we all someone who can be changed and allow, if we allow God to do it in our lives? By the grace of Christ, Scripture tells us if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old is gone, the new has come, right? He who the Son has set free is what? Is free. Truly, truly free. We're all someone who can be changed. It's a matter whether or not we will be willing to be someone who can be changed. See, is is change a one-time event? Change is an ongoing process. Somebody would say, you know what? I got saved when I was a little kid, about three or four or five years old in Sunday school class. I got saved. I'm good. That's the starting point. That's not the ending point. Change continues to occur in our lives each and every day. And we get up and we deal with ourselves in different ways. And God deals with us. And whether or not we're willing to respond to God dealing with us comes down to whether or not we're willing to change. And let me just say that we're in a sanctuary filled with people. We're all someone who could be changed if we're willing. 
So what do we not see? You know, when we look around the room, what do we not see? We see a lot of faces we know. We see a lot of people we know. What do we not see in a room like this here? Here it is. You don't see all the people who aren't here. You don't see the hurting that are around us. The lady who almost came to church but was afraid she might not be welcomed or looked at differently because she couldn't dress quite right. In her mind, she thought that and didn't come. The guy who was invited, but he decided he wanted to stay home and maybe watch a game or go out and do some target practicing out at his place. See, we don't see the people who need to be here. All the people who used to go, here's one we don't see, all the people who used to come, but since COVID decided it's much easier, we changed everything, we'll resume everything else in my life, but going back to church. Oh, hey folks at home, how you doing? Yeah, I know not all of you, it's that reason, but I know there's some. Yeah. Oh yeah, I started back to work. Oh, good, good, yeah. Uh, you hit the grocery store. Oh yeah, I'm going to, you go to the restaurant. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. The only thing they didn't resume was gathering back in here. So who are we? We're the church. We're the church. See, we don't go to church. We are the church, aren't we? We exist for a world that is hurting and needs Christ. We're all simply just broken people. Saved by Jesus, aren't we? And we need to be loving those who are hurting and in need of healing and they may be sitting next to us. They may be sitting in front of us. They may be sitting behind us. They may be wishing they would come here, but we're all so focused forward that we forget to look behind us at who's coming behind us. Jesus loves them outside of these walls. Outside of these walls are thousands and thousands of people who don't know Christ. You realize that, right? I mean, if we were to walk out of this neighborhood, out of this church, and just go through the neighborhood knocking on doors, I would dare say that we would probably, with a, about a 70 to 80%, find most everybody home not engaged in the church anywhere. You know, and then on my way home, a lot of times I'll drive by the bowling alley. The place is packed. Not that that's a bad thing. Bowling is fun. Some are just missing the connect of Jesus in their lives. See, we all, we all are someone in need. We're, we're all those people who become someone who cares. God wants to do that in us. And by God's grace, we all can be changed, can't we? So the question comes back to which one are you? What's your starting point? It's different for each of us. Our starting point. I'm going to invite you just to stand with me today as we close. I'm going to have less in just a second lead a song, but let me pray. Father, I pray these words today would sink in and quick our hearts. Draw us to you. Where are we? Who are we? What are we? What do we need? What are we doing? Where do we need to change? Where do we need to grow? What do we need to do? Touch us today. Let's sing this song together. Leave behind your regrets and mistakes. Come today, there's no reason to wait. Jesus is calling. Bring your sorrows and trade them for joy. From the ashes, a new life is born. Jesus is calling. Say it. Oh, come to the altar. The Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Oh, come to the altar. 
The Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was brought with the precious blood of Jesus. You know, today in this moment, usually I say bow your heads, close your eyes. I'm going to say put your heads up, open your eyes. Where did you find yourself in the story today? Where did you find yourself? Because you had to have, every one of us had to have identified ourselves with one of, or more of these. Are you someone in need? Are you going in a crisis in your life? Are you going through something and you just, it's not wrong to be in need. It's okay to be in need. Are you someone in need today? If you are, then, then you need to get to the altar is what you need. You need to bring that to God and turn it over to Him and allow Him to touch you today. Are you someone who cares? That's awesome. I love it. You burdened for the lost. You're hurting for others around you and broken. And, and so I would say to you, you come to the altar and allow God to just continue to raise that burden in you and to allow you the moment to just transform you with fresh ideas of how to reach the lost, the hurting, and the broken. Maybe you're someone today who's preoccupied. I think a lot of us fall into that category today. Focused elsewhere, failed to see the lost and hurting around you because you are focused on Christ, and that's not wrong. But we cannot see what's behind us if we are not looking. Maybe we need to see the hurting and the lost. I would say today, if you've been preoccupied, then this altar is a place that you need to bring that and say, God, I want to stay focused on you, but I also want to see the hurting around me. Come to this altar if that's you today. Maybe you're someone who's critical. Maybe you've been so focused on the past rules or the way we did things or the way we should do things. And how come we're this and why are we that? And I can't believe that preacher said that. Whatever it is. That in that moment, of something of your, your spiritual living, you've forgotten what it's all about. You've forgotten that following Christ is what it's really about. And that can mean a lot of different things. If that's you, then you need to be down here at this altar today, allowing God to soften those hardened edges in your life. Or maybe the bottom line is, is that we all need change in our lives today, don't we? We all could use God just waking us up from the spot we're at. And we need to be at the altar today. I don't care who it is. I want to throw these altars open today. You come. Eyes open. Head up. It doesn't matter. We're all in need of change today.